Susanna of the Alamo, a true story, written by John Jakes and illustrated and designed by Paul Bacon. San Antonio de Bear in the Mexican province of Texas, February 23rd, 1836. Look there, Sue, cried a young blacksmith named Almiron Dickinson. I know that signal. The red flag means the Mexican soldiers will show no mercy. Their general, Santa Ana, wants to scare us. The young woman standing beside him, his wife, Susana, was already afraid. She feared for Amaron and for her, their daughter, Elizabeth Angelina, almost 15 months old. Earlier that day, General Santa Ana's army rode into the town of San Antonio. Many people left after learning that more soldiers were on the way. But the Dickinsons and more than 150 other Texans didn't run. They moved inside an old mission called the Alamo and turned it into a fort. Susana felt a sudden chill as she and Almiron stood together on the Alamo wall. And you can see the Alamo wall right here. Was it caused by the winter weather or their danger? Won't Santa Ana talk with us? She said to him, Mexico used to be friendly to Americans. We were asked to come to Texas to fill up the land. Mexico wanted settlers. But then Santa Ana became president. He took away our rights, replied Almiron. No use talking to a man like that, a dictator. All we can do is stand up for what we believe. Susana was only 22 years old. She couldn't read or write, but she was a caring mother, a loving wife. She and Almiron had come to San Antonio last fall from the village of Gonzalez. Gonzalez was their home after they moved to Texas from Tennessee in 1831. Life had been good in Gonzales. Susana and Almiron were young, strong, hopeful. But now, as she gazed at that red flag, Susana worried about the future. Were they going to lose everything in a fight for freedom? The Texans defending the Alamo hoped to block the advance of Santa Ana's army and gain time for General Sam Houston leader of the much smaller Texas army to gather more men. The stone and adobe buildings of the old mission were strong, but partly in ruins. Once, Franciscan priest had lived there, and there were some soldiers from the Alamo de Parras in Mexico. Those soldiers were liked by the local people, who nicknamed them Los Alamos. When the soldiers left, the name stuck to the place that had sheltered them. Those in the Alamo with Susana and Almiron also came from far places. Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Europe. One, even, one had even served in Napoleon's army years before. There was former Congressman Davy Crockett of Tennessee, famous for tall tales and for killing ferocious bears that attacked him. He rode all the way from Tennessee to help. He brought 12 men his fiddle, a long rifle that he called Betsy. There was also Jim Bowie, an adventurer who carried a big hunting knife, later named after him. He was supposed to share command of the Alamo, but he got sick, so the other commander took charge. He was William B. Travis, a 26-year-old lawyer from Alabama. His past was mysterious, some trouble over a woman, but he was a strong leader. Not everyone in the Alamo was American. Some of the Texans were Mexican, like Gregorio Esparza, who brought his wife and four children. He didn't like Santa Ana either, but the thought of fighting his own brother sat in him. Maybe your brother is in Santa Ana's army, said Susana, trying to comfort Esparza. Yes, he is. He is afraid of El Presidente, but we must not be afraid to fight to be free of Santa Ana's unjust laws. Texans should be treated fairly, just like any citizen of Mexico. El Presidente started this war, Almiron said. Too many Americans have settled in Texas. 
He thinks we're too strong now. No one showed that strength more than Almiron, Susana thought as they spoke. He was a kindly man with, a power, with powerful arms and hands a blacksmith needed. As a smithy and former soldier, he knew artillery. He was in charge of the cannon brought into the Alamo. The sight of him, so brave and tall, made Susana love him more. This is the picture of Travis. He is the one that took over after Bowie got sick. Later that day, one of Santana's officers came to demand surrender. Travis ordered an Al the Alamo's 18-pound cannon to fire one round, a thundering no. But the defenders were surrounded. A siege began. The next day, Susana's fears grew. Almiron told her from the wall he saw many more soldiers arriving, Mexican soldiers arriving. Then she heard cannon fires and rifle shots. Before the day was over, Travis wrote a letter saying the defenders would never give up. Victory or death, he wrote just above his name. On the fourth day, 32 men from Gonzales risked their lives to gallop into the mission. They all made it. Many were friends of the Dickinsons. The weather was cold, bitter cold now. Bowie was still sick with pneumonia and Travis was writing more letters pleading for help. He sent them out at the night with messengers who bravely dashed, there they go, they bravely dashed uh, at night, with, who bravely dashed on horseback through showers of bullets. Most of all, Travis needed the 400 armed Texans waiting at Goliad under the command of Colonel James Fannin. Outside, Santa Ana's men kept digging trenches, each one nearer to the Alamo. Before long, soldiers and Texans were so close they could shout insults at each other. The situation was desperate. Even so, a few happy moments gleamed. Travis liked Susana's pretty little daughter. He gave Angelina one of his treasures, a ring set with a shimmering cat's eye stone. And here's a picture of it. Travis, Travis's slave Joe smiled with approval. Now and then, Davy Crockett scraped out a tune on his fiddle. There's Davy Crockett with his fiddle. Davy's music was one of the few happy sounds left. One of Travis's me messengers, James Bonham, and you can see him coming in, appeared suddenly after riding all the way back from Goli at 95 miles. He brought bad news. Fannin was hesitating with his 400 men. Bonham returned rather than Bonham returned rather than abandoned his friends. If Bonham can be so brave, Susanna thought, I must too. <clears throat> 10 days passed, 11, 12. Gunfire from both sides remained steady. Santa Ana's military bands played during the night, so the Texans lost sleep. The Mexican army kept growing to 2,000, then three. Eating a supper of fried beans with Susana, Elmeron, exhausted, shook his head. Sometimes I wonder why we're holding out, Sue. Killing isn't right or good. Those soldiers out there don't want to die any more than we do. I know, she said softly, but maybe we want to be free more than they do. Gazing at her with love, he reached out and squeezed her hand and nodded. Before dawn on Sunday, March 6th, Santana's army was stirring, were stirring. Dozing in an old damp blanket with Angelina in her arms, Susana woke suddenly. What's that music? She whispered. Guns were cracking outside the chapel. Artillery matches glowed near the cannons of the wall. Susana stared into the hor horrified face of the friend, Senora Esparza. You know what that bulge means, Senora. Please tell me. Santana is tormenting us. It is the dehuello. It means the same thing as the big red flag. Show no mercy, kill everyone. Sharp as knives, the bulge notes flew through the air. Susana clutched her baby. She heard shouting, ladders thumping against the Alamo walls. She rushed into the plaza, and as the first enemy rocket lit in the paling sky, she saw Travis running towards the north wall, carrying a sword and gun and shotgun. 
Before Crockett and others pushed Susana back into safety, she heard Travis's cry. The Mexicans are upon us! Susana's heart beat fast. With other women and children, she huddled in the sacristy, which is a small room off the chapel. Hers was the only American face. All, but all the faces shared a common look. It seemed to say, we are frightened, but we stayed here to show that we are what we are made of. Now it's time. In the sacristy, Susana never saw the final brief battle, only heard of it. Booming cannons, shouts of attackers and defenders, cries of the wounded and dying, Almiron calling orders to his canoe cannoneers. Angelina fretted, clutched her mother's apron. Susana knew the Texans were losing. Suddenly, powder-stained Almiron was there. Great God, Sue, the Mexicans. All of Santa Ana's bands were playing the Teguello together so everyone could hear it above the gunfire. There inside the north wall, hear them? Viva Santa Ana! Viva Santa Ana! If they spare you, save our child. And he was gone forever. So he said goodbye to her. So all Susana and her daughter could do is listen and hear all of the screams and all of the cannons and the and the guns shooting away. Such a short battle, nearly over by 6.15 in the morning. The women and children were huddled together at the mercy of the soldiers in chants. Senora Esparza cried out when she glimpsed her husband fall in the chapel. Susana remembered the bulges. No mercy, they said, no quarter. More and more soldiers swarmed through the chapel. Almiron's gone, Susana thought. She hugged Angelina tighter. Grief fell on her like a ha hammer blows. She too wanted to cry out. Instead, she prayed. At half past six, the last defender was gone. The Alamo had fallen. The women and children were ordered to move to a smaller room, the baptistry. Susana felt the end was near. She would do her best to meet it calmly. If there was time, she would beg the enemy to spare Angelina's life. The soldier entered. He noticed Susana's white face at once. His bassinet rose to strike. His bayonet, sorry. Stop, an officer strode in. Is there a Senora Dickinson here? For a minute, she couldn't understand how he would know. But of course, Santa Ana would have heard from people in town about the women and children in the Alamo. She raised her hand. Yes. Don't stand there, the officer growled. Bring your child and come with me if you want to save your life. She dragged her, he dragged her out, stepping over the smashed down chapel doors. Blessed Lord, forgive them, Susana whispered when they saw the plaza. And this were the, this is what she saw. Smoke all over the Alamo grounds. And this is where Susana had been in a little, little room right here. And she was seeing everybody who was dead and bleeding or hurting. And I'm going to stop right here.